Good morning and welcome to the August 2nd, 2018 business meeting and we'll start with a roll. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Of course, we have Mr. Nate Boderman representing the County Council's office this morning. And as always, Mary Rathke serving as your clerk to the board. We have uh, Commissioner Fisher on the phone this morning, so I will start uh, with her for the roll. Commissioner Fisher? Here. Commissioner Humberston? Here. Commissioner Schrader? Here. Chair Bernard? Here. And of course, uh, Commissioner Savas is uh, currently out of town on county business. So. All right, thank you very much. And with that, will you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, first up, we have a presentation. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a presentation on Water Environment Services Watershed Health Education Program, and we have uh, uh, Gary Johnson here to present this item to you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Water Environment Services developed the Watershed Health Education Program to educate youth about the importance of protecting our watersheds. This program makes it possible for local teachers and their students to get out of the classroom and into the field where they gain hands-on experience making assessments, restoring streamside habitats, and studying the factors that determine healthy rivers and streams. These students can then share their knowledge with friends, family, and the broader community through presentations and activities, making an even bigger impact on protecting public health and the environment. West works with partners to educate both high school and elementary school students in our community. And some of the projects span multiple years. Today, we wanna to share a short video about our work with Friends of Trees, a partner of over 10 years. After the video, you'll hear all about the exciting student education activities with one of our newest partners, the Lower Columbia Estuary Partnership. Great, thank you. For nearly a decade, Students from Oregon Trail Elementary have been planting trees along Rose Creek to improve and revitalize the area. And now that spring has sprung, partners from all over the county have gathered to continue their efforts to plant trees and inspire the next generation of environmental stewards. Today we're out here along Rose Creek working with the Oregon Trail Elementary fifth grade students along with high school classes um, from the Sabin area that are in a forestry class together. And the high school students are being crew leaders today, teaching the fifth graders how to plant native species. Two, one, eight, eight, two, three. Part of my mission as a natural resource teacher is to try to make good citizens. So having my students educating younger people is going to instill that. And for the younger students, it's just to be able to connect with somebody who's slightly older than them, somebody who's not a teacher, somebody who's a little bit more on their level. So it's a great opportunity for both, both groups. Mrs. Johnson, I think she's a great teacher. She really inspires me to work hard because like, she makes us work hard, but while doing it, she also makes it very fun. Yeah, I've learned some things, like how if you plant invasive species in places where native species are, it can really harm them. I think it's kind of fun. I mean, when I grow up, I'll probably come back here and see, hey, those are the trees that we planted and now they're fully grown. Put the tree! And now I'd like to um, introduce you to Deborah Marriott, the Estuary Partnerships Executive Director who will now describe the intensive watershed science education that's happening both streamside and on the water. Thank you, Gary. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the commission, um, I'm very pleased to be here. I am Deb Marriott. I'm the executive director of the Lower Columbia Estuary Partnership. We are one of the nation's 28 estuaries of national significance, a program that uh, Congress developed in 1987 uh, to uh, empower local communities to look at a watershed body of importance to them and to the nation and to identify issues with that body and then work as a diverse community to address its issues. 
We work in habitat restoration. We do water quality and toxics reduction. And as part of that, what I consider some of our most important work is the work we do with students. We each year take about 4,500 students out doing very similar uh, programs to what you saw with Friends of Trees. I like to say it's our most important work because if we don't have good science and good information going to our younger citizens and community members when they get to be decision makers, we, need, we just want them to be well informed to make the decisions right for them. We have been thrilled to be a partner with um, Water Environment Services for the last two years. We're in year two of a three-year partnership right now. Um, I'm going to try to do two things at once, like talk and chew gum or something. Um, when we started our partnership, we said that um, our program was comprised, comprised of uh, several components, and the most important is giving science lessons. We said we'd work with about 250 students a year. Um, we use the uh, Clackamas County um, uh, Watershed Health Curriculum and the curriculum that we've developed over the years. And as you saw with Friends of Trees, this is a very hands-on um, education program. It's also an intensive science program. What we're finding is in K-6 programs, uh, science is being taught less as the emphasis on reading and math has increased. So we help teachers use science to teach math and reading. Um, and then we get kids out in their schoolyard and in local um, parks and uh, recreation areas to plant trees, remove invasive species, and understand the, the health of the watershed and the role stormwater plays um, in their lives and our lives. Um, we have six professional educators on our staff, many with master's um, degrees, and they're the uh, people that are implementing this program for you. So as I said, we promised about 250 teach, uh, students a year. We do work largely with elementary students. We're excited about that because Clackamas County and your investments in the past have done a lot of work with high school, so now we're helping feed those younger students so they're even better prepared when they get to high school and access the programs that you've been doing for many years with those students. Um, as I said, we're two years in. Um, what we've delivered so far are 17 classes, so that's about 675 students so far, with, and we've worked with 17 teachers. One of the really important things about working with the teachers um, is they learn these skills, so we don't have to go back every year to the same teacher, although they seem to want us back every year, um, but they learn the skills themselves. We have uh, checkout curriculum kits that they can use to take to do the work themselves after they've gone through our work. We also are hosting a workshop through your uh, generosity this summer to help train teachers to do even more uh, teaching outside and to use your curriculum and our curriculum. So those students have planted 225 trees so far. They've removed over 18 truckloads of invasive species. Um, they have great competitions trying to outdo each other with who's pulling the longest black uh, uh, piece of ivy or um, black, uh, blackberry. Uh, so it's, they, they, you know, kids just sort of rise to the challenge and uh, have a lot of fun while they're learning. As you saw in that video, a lot of these students haven't been out much before. We have students looking at robins saying they've never seen one before. A lot of students haven't been to the water and to the, or to the local parks before. So that's just paramount to us to get them outside so they can see how this all comes together. Um, th this slide you can look at later. It's just a breakdown so you can see which schools we've worked with um, thanks to your investment and where those students are coming from. We have one more year in this grant. Important to us and probably to you is to do some assessment of how, their, how our programs are affecting students. So we do survey about 25% of all the students that we work with each year. We work with a professor from the University of, uh, or from Portland, Pacific University, I'm sorry, who's developed our survey instrument and we measure the students' learning before and after our program and then their, um, how excited and some sort of elements like how excited they are and likely to return. Um, we have a very high percentage of um, increased knowledge and a high percentage of kids who want to come back, just like that student. Uh, that was a great lead-in for me. Thank you, Gary, um, that video from Friends of Trees. So our biggest challenge right now is the demand is exceeding our funding. Uh, we had teachers call us just a few weeks ago asking, we don't, uh, we're grant funded, of course, and wanted to do programs in areas and we didn't have funding and they just can't afford the program. So we're, that's our biggest challenge with everywhere we work is teachers just need those resources. So we're very excited for your investment. 
Um, these are the places that we've been with your resources. Meldrum Bar is a huge um, uh, living laboratory for us. Um, their own schoolyards are important. It's great to just take kids right outside so they can see that nature is all around us. It's at their home, it's in their school, and of course, local natural areas. We are all about partnerships, as our name implies. So we work with cities and Metro and, of course, you. And um, it takes all of us to make this work. So from the students that you have helped support, thank you very much. Um, I forgot to mention we have two large canoes that hold about um, 14 students, so we're able to get a full classroom out on the water paddling as part of that four-hour field experience that they go through with us. So uh, that's a great opportunity. One of the recent times we were out on Meldrum Bar with your resources, a storm came up, so we had a little test of our ability to get those kids to paddle and sink and get them to the shore safely, but they did it, and uh, I had a pretty good time, I think, and didn't get wet that day, so that was great. I thank you very much for your time and for your support. We're excited about this program and appreciate your investment in us. Well, thank you, and, and there's an additional problem that we, I just returned from an aqua conference, mm -hmm. uh, and that is uh, employment. Finding people to go to work in, in our clean water facilities is very challenging, and uh, we need to, I, we, we were at, uh, actually talking about a classroom where we could bring people in to experience the work. Uh, that's probably true in many of our departments, uh, but uh, we're having trouble finding people, and you really got to start early. And I think your program uh, uh, demonstrates our efforts, but again, we need to kind of direct people to the thought of becoming, making this part of their career. And so I think this is a good start. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our, we have a member of our board who's a, a Beaverton School District uh, representative, and she's been very helpful. And one of the things I've learned is that by sixth grade, a lot of us have determined what we're good at and not good at. So if kids aren't exposed to these programs in that K through six area, they won't recognize that there are careers and opportunities um, in a wide range of fields related to this. So I, I think you're exactly right. I appreciate yeah, that. That's right. Of course, I didn't know when I was that young what I was going to do. Right. I didn't expect to be here, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank, thank you. you. Oh, Martha, you had yeah. a... Yeah, I didn't expect to be here either, but you know, it takes uh, really good uh, good turns. You know, I'm glad I'm here. But um, I want to ask you, okay, how do you integrate this with outdoor school that Oregon runs? Is there any nexus with that? Our programs and our curriculum are developed with the teachers, okay. um, so that we are supporting their outdoor uh, curriculum as well. Um, in some schools we have actually gone in before the outdoor week occurs okay. and done several series of lessons for the students, including the outdoor work. Um, but we're diligent about making sure and refining our curriculum and adapting it through the years with teachers so that we are feeding their uh, outdoor school experience as well as Common Core and the Next Generation Science Standards. Well, I'm so delighted that you're doing this. Way back in my, my past, I was... Um, a biology and environmental education major at Cornell, and this is what I had actually originally had aspired to do, but now I get to do this and support uh, uh, folks like my friend Gary and you to really spread this around to the rest of the of our school systems, and so I would love to volunteer at some point. I still, I still rem remember enough limnology that I could, I could be remotely helpful, I think, but um, K-6 yeah. is my favorite age group, oh, actually, great. of kids. So. A good paddler, too. I've seen oh, yeah, excellent. I can paddle. Oh. I can take them out and paddle. There you go. So, But thank, thank you, you for your hard work. This is really, uh, what can we do? The other question I have is, what can we do to help you with your grant process? Extension of grants? Do you need letters of support? Do you need, you know, what, how does that work? Um, probably all of ab the above. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Obviously, your funding is, is critical and helpful. Right. Um, I, yeah. Your letters of support and your partnership, um, your engagement as you've been as active partners. We, as we say, we investment in us financially is important, but having that, those active partners that 
and your offer to volunteer is very specific to that, but um, just spreading that the word and making sure that K-6 is well supported as well as our high school, stu school, st high school students and their science programs. Um, so we yeah, will. This is a great, Thank this you. is really a great idea. I'm glad we're doing that. And um, people often don't understand the role that the county has in education. They think that maybe we are not as directly involved. And this is a program that shows indeed we have we have involvement in educational opportunities for K-12 in ways that um, really add to the curriculum and add to the capacity of our school districts to do STEM education. So thank you for the, thank you for that. This is great. So. Thank you. And if I just may, we also make sure the students know who the partners are, that businesses, governments are all part of this so they don't see protecting the environment as something somebody right. else does, so your involvement is very important for that, so thank you very much. Okay. Great. Thank Sonia, you. you're on the phone. Did you want to add anything? I really appreciated the presentation. It was um, heartwarming to see all the good work that we're doing. I really appreciated hearing that there are teachers that want this support and this programming, so I think we have our work ahead of us, and really wanting to support these efforts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, um, in my uh, past life, as they say, in, in my career, I worked with uh, juvenile gang members quite a bit in, uh, in Southern California, uh, many of whom lived within two miles or less of the, of the ocean, mm -hmm. and yet had never been to the ocean, mm -hmm. had never actually seen a tide pool. So one of the things that I used to do periodically is take groups of kids, um, all gang members, and just take them to the ocean, take them to the tide pools, and let them see some things that they'd never seen before. And the eye, it's an eye-opener for many of them. Who knows what kind of life-changing things may or may not occur, but just exposing them to these kinds of things, I think, is beneficial. So thank you for what you do. Well, thank you for what you do. Thank you. Thank you, thank you yeah. very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is citizen communication. We have Adam and Rob. After that, Jay. Which one's Adam? <laughs> All right, go ahead. Good morning, commissioners. How are you guys doing today? Great. All righty, I wanted to uh, address an issue um, that came through our committee to preserve the Second Amendment. Um, and I'm sure you are aware of this, Chair Bernard, and uh, the rest of you also received the same thing. It was an email written by a former law enforcement agent named Tom McCurgan. Dear Commissioners, one of our committee members, Mr. Rob Reynolds, has requested to be placed on the agenda of the Clackamas County Board of Commissioners to introduce an ordinance to further enhance our inherent right to keep and bear arms as guaranteed by the U.S. and Oregon Constitutions. This committee fully supports Mr. Reynolds and Associates in their efforts to bring to this, this commission, bring this to the commission and the public. We understand that he has not been yet accorded his right to do so under the First Amendment for redress of grievances. We ask that you grant his request for the following additional reasons. I travel across Oregon to promote the Second Amendment Preservation Ordinance, aka SAPO. Thus far, we've successfully passed ordinances in four counties to include Willowa, Wheeler, Coos, and Curry which were fully supported by their respected county sheriffs. The city of Myrtle Point has also passed the SAPO, supported by their police chief. Currently, there are six Oregon counties that will have the SAPO on the November ballot with the prospect of even more counties filing initiatives or referrals. Here in Douglas County, the commissioners chose one of three options in deliberation over this matter. The first would be for the Board of Commissioners to simply pass it. However, the next elected board would be able to rescind it. The second option would be for me to file a county initiative and collect signatures. The third option was deemed the most appropriate and acceptable among their constituents, which was to place it on the ballot for the people to decide. 
which, if passed, could not be rescinded without a vote of the people. As you can see, the referral process has the least political ramifications and is the best course that this committee strongly suggests you take. With the current Oregon legislature introducing seemingly never-ending anti never anti-gun bills, Oregon residents who are pro-Second Amendment are growing increasingly concerned that their right to keep and bear arms is in critical, imminent jeopardy. Unfortunately, the people can no longer ask the state to uphold their oaths to protect our rights. And I'm going to go ahead and skip, since I don't have much time, um, to your response. Tom McCurgan, respectfully, one of the few powers the chair has is setting the agenda. I have no intention of putting this issue on the agenda. I have sworn to uphold the Constitution and will do so. Your interpretation of the Constitution is exactly that, an interpretation. We have an opportunity for all to testify before the commission, and that is the place to express your opinion. And I sit behind the desk and express my First Amendment rights by saying, no, I will not put it on the agenda. Okay, thank you. We have heard from, the commi from Commissioner Bernard Bernard's email and two weeks ago when he said he would not allow the ordinance to be on his on his agenda I'm going to take I'm going to make a, a couple of statements and please correct me if I'm wrong uh, Chairman Bernard your last election you won by 87,264 votes Commissioner Schrader you won by 48,262 votes Commissioner Savas uh, 38,989 votes Commissioner Fisher, uh, 46,059 votes. Commissioner Humberston, Humberson, uh, 83,634 votes. Now, you work for the people of Clackamas County. Now, the commission charged, uh, changed the commission, county commissions from parties to non-party uh, non affiliated, so it's a nonpartisan position. Where we stand is we are not representing a party, we're rep representing the Second Amendment. We're representing everybody in Clackamas County. So our frustration by not being allowed to be put on the agenda is there are 45,000 people in Clackamas County that have a carry, concealed carry permit, 45,000. So that's 50% of your votes, Commissioner Bernard, that's over the amount of uh, votes that Commissioner Savas got. So there's a lot of people uh, out there that have carried concealed permits that this is important to. There are, uh, in Oregon, uh, $2.5 billion was spent on hunting and fishing. So our, our guns are important to us. Our right to hunt is important to us, and this has been put in front of us as being taken away by like measures like IP43, which we don't know that the state won't try to pass the same thing. And what we're asking is that Clackamas County stand up and support its residents, that our voice means something to you, and that you show Clackamas County residents that you want them involved in what's going on in their county. And, you know, you don't have to pass the ordinance. We're not asking you to pass the ordinance. We're asking you to put it on the agenda so people can come in and speak about it. That's it. We're not preventing anyone from speaking about it. You're here today speaking about it. Uh, you know, uh, I have the uh, authority to uh, put things on the agenda. Uh, the board would have to vote to put it on the ballot. Yeah. Uh, if you have so many people interested in putting it on the ballot, Collect the signatures. I don't have a problem with that. We're trying to save. We're trying to save the county money by going this way. You're asking to spend more money because then you have to count the signatures before we get it on the ballot. We're trying to sidestep so that you can save the county money. But you're not looking at it from that. It seems like, and may, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're looking at it from a political view that you're not for the Second Amendment and for protecting our rights. <laughs> No, and I said before, and I'll say it again, I swore to support the Constitution of the United States and of Oregon, and I do. I have a gun. I have a rifle. I hunt. Okay. So I don't have a problem with that. I'm just so saying that you if you read it, why your material. Why don't you put it on the agenda then? 
It's, I mean, if you have a gun and you, and you hunt, I don't understand. Why won't you just put it on the agenda and, and bring it up for a uh, public, uh, public? Because I don't like to put our people in a position of a gotcha. So if Martha we're, doesn't we're support to protect, it, we're trying can, to protect the Clackamas County citizens, not a gotcha. It's it's to protect them to allow uh, their safety to own own a firearm, and that's they what already we're to are do. allowed to do that. But people are trying to take that away from them. And how are they going to do that? They're going to come I, and take the gun. Yes, that's not that's not possible. IP forty three would have been would have made that possible. And, and they said they would re resubmit it this next time. So They don't even know I, except now, they, do. they don't even know I own a gun. I, it's not registered. You don't have to register a hunting rifle. Yeah. Okay. They're going to come and get my rifle? I don't think so. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Hey, thank you. We had uh, Jay. And Les. And Les, apparently. Oh, yeah. And Les, you might as well come up, too. Hello, my name's Jay Perkins. I've been a resident of this uh, county now for 17 years. And after uh, going through, uh, I just got your the latest Clackamas County Quarterly in which you, uh, Clackamas, Clackamas County Commissioners, have put up your five priorities that... Uh, you seem to uh, really want to ex uh, stress. So the one point, the two points on here that I'm really concerned about is build public trust through good government and ensure the safe, health, and secure communities. And by refusing to allow this to go before the public, you're basically not following through on what you classify as a top priority. You're not, by not allowing this to get to the, to the people of the county, I take it then you're not really interested in upholding your oaths. And I just, just don't see it coming from the responses that you've given to the questions that you've been asked. And all what I'm asking is that you put it before the public to let them decide. This isn't a choice until we have our voice in the county. And I ask you that you put it before the people. That's all. And I ask you to put it before the people. I have I never been. said I wouldn't put it before the people. You just have to collect the signatures to do it. I mean, you say you have 45, 46,000 people with cover a license to uh, carry a gun. It should be easy to collect the signatures, and I and again, you're, it, you're wasting county money when you can sidestep that. So again, where is it a priority? It doesn't take much to count. What is it? How many signatures? Thousand or something? It's pretty pretty easy to collect signatures. Seventy five hundred. Seventy five hundred. Okay. Eleven thousand five hundred. Eleven thousand five hundred. Somebody has the right figure. I bet I do. I will bet I do. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, as someone that's been involved in petitions before in the county, it's based on a percentage of the people that vote in the last governor's general election. The bottom line is uh, someone would need about 11,000 plus valid signatures to get on the ballot. So it, it's not easy. It's a lot of work. And then once you're on the ballot, of course, it's a lot of work. Um, speaking of a lot of work, for those that didn't hear me last week, I want to repeat that I'm taking on an even larger petition, an initiative, and that is to place the uh, tolling issue on a, on a statewide ballot. And very simply, we are not opposed to tolling. If they were going to expand 205 or do something like they did with the radio network here, other, other the, the, the issues like broadband, the public will support those things. We always vote in high numbers to support the sheriff, public safety, and we're certainly willing to spend a lot on roads. But when the state intends to impose tolling on existing roads, 
with some vague promise, and I'll say that again, a vague promise that, well, down the road, we'll start fixing capacity and the problems. Um, it's ill-conceived. I don't think it will stand. And I'm going to do everything I can within my, my own personal control, and, 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 and I'm, I've got others helping me. I'm certainly not out there alone to get that first 1,000 signatures we need uh, so that by September, uh, the ballot title process begins, and sometime before the end of the year, hopefully we'd see a, a final language that had been through the whole state process. And at that point, we have to collect over 100,000 more signatures. Valid. So it's a big undertaking, but I see this much like the way I see Measure 97. It's an ambiguous, very, very, very large amount of money that really isn't very well directed. And I cannot imagine what it's going to do to commerce. I mean, we're, we're charging the trucks. What, what will the fee be for a truck? Does anyone in the room have the answer? Well, I can guarantee you it's going to be a lot more than it will be for a car. And if they're going to charge you $7 for a round trip to go over the bridge between Oregon City and West Lynn, what are they going to charge the truck with your groceries? Real simple questions. Um, I want to change, I want to make in, in my remaining time. I'd like to just put a shout out out for the Clackamas County Fair. Um, it, it's a great fair. They've got a rodeo. It's still got the the, the hometown feel to it. Um, I, I'm just a big supporter of of 4-H and the extension service. You want to keep the kids off drugs. You want to keep the kids engaged. You get them involved in 4-H, you get them involved in a fair, you take them down to the beach and get them out of downtown, and their whole perspective changes. It really does. So anything we can do to keep our fair going is great. And people will have more money to spend at the fair if they're not having to spend it on tolls to get there. <laughs> Thank you. Ken. Uh, just a reminder uh, uh, <clears throat> that um, this, this board said that if tolling were to occur, however they figure this out, that uh, our position was that that money should go into an ex uh, uh, capacity. Ca capacity expansion. Yeah. By the, and by that we meant more freeway lane uh, to, to uh, handle the traffic. So we have limited control over what the state does. I know you know that less. Um, I appreciate what you're doing uh, with your initiative. Um, but this board was very clear that if that has to be done, it ought to be done uh, with the money being used for the capacity and not just as a way to um, keep people off the freeway. That should not be the total objective. So I wanted to respond to that. The other is that I'd like to suggest a Saturday night at the rodeo, Saddle Bronc, that's the best thing. You know, the other thing is, is that uh, I think the goal of tolling is social engineering. Uh, you know, yeah. the, 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 it would be great if businesses were open 24 hours a day and they could go to their job whenever their schedule is. But most of us um, go to the job at 8 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock in the morning, and that means we don't have a choice, and that's the problem. Uh, and so without capacity to get to work easier or faster because uh, there isn't a traffic jam, that's what we should be looking at doing. So I, I don't have an issue with what, what you're doing at all. And I know Paul would. Well, I'm not going to speak for Paul, so <laughs> never mind. Uh, all right. With that, we'll move on to a couple public hearings. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Ken Martin, our boundary change consultant, up to the dais. Uh, we do have two public hearings involving boundary change proposals. The first is uh, for a board order for boundary change proposal CL17-005, annexation to Tri-City County Service District. Uh, so, Mr. Martin. The uh, Tri-City County Service District is the district that provides the more or less wholesale services to Oregon City. And so whenever we have an annexation that occurs to Oregon City, that property needs to be subsequently annexed into the district so that it's under the district's rules and paying uh, whatever the district charges. 
And that's what we have in this case. We have a single property owner annexed into the city of Oregon City. Uh, we had to wait quite a while for this one to, to get done because you can't annex it into the district until it's actually completed the annexation into the city. And this has been sitting around for a year or more before we could have this happen. But now we do have this in front of you. Uh, the district provides the wholesale service. The retail connection to the actual property is still being provided by the city of Oregon City. But we need to annex it into the district. And if the district can provide the service, we'd recommend approval. Right, but isn't this technically wrong? Shouldn't it be called Wes? There is no Tri-Cities. Well, the, there still is technically the underlying service district that, that exists that is bound together with uh, the stormwater uh, service district and CCSD number one into the 190 partnership we refer to as West. But from just a strict sort of technical boundary amendment, we're really talking about amending into the Tri-City Service District. Uh, and then that rolls up into the 190 partnership. So mm -hmm. that's, that's yeah, how it's set up. The yeah. service is really provided by West, but there is an existing legal district formed under the uh, Oregon Revised Statutes, and that's what we have to, to follow and make sure that it gets into that unit. I thought we had gone through the process and that no longer was true, but it seems kind of complicated. It, it is. Well, there must be a way to clean that up a little bit, but anyway. All right. Um, so, any questions? No. Uh, entertain a motion. Oh, anyone wish to speak on this matter? Seeing none, um, I'll close the public portion of the hearing and uh, entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve the board order for boundary change proposal CL17-005 annexation to Tri-City County Service District. Second. Was that the dog barking yes? No, I guess. <laughs> All right, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. So let's go to Sonia first. Sonia? Aye. And the rest of us? Aye. 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 Uh, motion carries. The next item on the agenda? Uh, yes, a very similar item. This is a public hearing to uh, consider a board order for a boundary change proposal, number CL18-006. And this is the annexation to the Clackamas County Service District number one. So go ahead, Mr. Martin. Once again, this is a similar situation in the sense that CCSD number one is the existing district. That district uh, does serve the city of Happy Valley. Uh, it actually provides all the service, both the retail and the wholesale service in that area. So anytime someone wants to get service that's in the city of Happy Valley, they need to annex into the district. Uh, the city of Happy Valley has acceded to this, and we'd recommend approval. Great. Um, uh, any questions? Mm -hmm. That I'll open the public hearing and ask if anyone would like to testify on this matter. Hold back the crowd. <laughs> uh, with that, I'll close the public hearing and entertain a motion. I move we approve the board order for boundary change proposal CL 18 006 annexation to Tri City County Service District. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the board order of boundary change proposal CL 18 006, annexation Tri Cities County Service District. Uh, any further discussion? Mr. Chair? Yes. Can I intervene here? Um, this one's wrong. Yeah, so it's Clackamas County Service District number one. So Technically, was, this one is wrong. Yes, so uh, okay. if you could amend the motion, that would be appreciated. All right, so amend the motion to uh, Clackamas, Clackamas County Service, Service District County number one. one. So, um, Sonia? Aye. Uh, and the rest of us? Aye. 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 With that, motion carries. Thank you very much. All right, the next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. I'll ask the clerk to read the consent agenda by title. Okay, today's consent agenda. Under Health, Housing, and Human Services, approval of an agreement with Northwest Family Services for cultural specific domestic violence shelter and services, approval of an intergovernmental subrecipient agreement, amendment number one to the Legal Aid Services of Oregon to provide housing rights and referral and legal assistance for Clackamas County residents, approval of an intergovernmental facility lease agreement with the Oregon Trail School District number 46 for the Sandy Health and Wellness Center, 
approval of a resolution declaring a state of emergency and emergency measures to address the housing crisis. Under the Department of Transportation and Development, <clears throat> excuse me, approval of an intergovernmental agreement with Oregon Department of Transportation related to the insurance of insurance of trip permits under finance, oh, issuance of trip permits under finance, authorization to purchase 18 Dodge Chargers for the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office and authorization to purchase 12 2019 Ford Transit 350 cargo vans for Clackamas County Facilities Management. Under elected officials, approval of previous business meeting minutes, approval of a resolution appointing Justice of the Peace pro tempore for the Clackamas County Justice Court, request by the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office to enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Estacada to provide the city's police services, and approval of a purchase from Command Sourcing, Inc. for a full body scanner for the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office. Underwater Environment Services, approval of a resolution authorizing a Department of Environmental Quality State Revolving Fund Loan Agreement with Water Environment Services to finance a solids handling project. And that concludes today's consent agenda. Any questions or anyone wish to pull an item from the consent agenda? Um, I don't have it. I don't want to pull anything. I just wanted to make a comment that on the incentive agenda today was um, a consent agenda day. Uh, is uh, an emergency housing. Uh, we're we're re-upping that because we are still faced with the housing crisis. So that is on our consent agenda. I'm glad we're doing it. It will expedite, in many ways, opportunities to get more capacity, actual housing, built and on the ground. And that's our hope. And I know that uh, our pods for veterans are moving along. I think that uh, my colleagues helped paint Saturday while I was off at another conference. and. Uh, we're making great strides in making sure that housing is front and center in Clackamas County. All right. All right. Uh, with that, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the consent agenda. Any further discussion? With that, we'll go to Sonia. Aye. <laughs> and the rest of us? Aye. Aye. Uh, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Sonia, do well, we'll go to the administrator update and then go to you. Okay, so I've got a couple of items for you. Uh, we got um, uh, several accolades again uh, shared uh, with my office uh, about several different county departments. I'm going to share a couple of them with you today. Uh, this has, first one has to do with our transportation and development staff, and we received a note from a satisfied business owner who had just relocated his business from Portland to Canby, and we like that. Uh, and his note says the following. In June 2016, you granted an extension to issue a building permit for Premier Gear Operational in Canby. Uh, it took us uh, time to get the transaction put back together, but uh, we picked up the permit, and now the project is finished. Just wanted to reach out and say thank you and that you made a difference in our project being successful. So I just wanted to give a few kudos to the staff in our building codes division for demonstrating excellent service uh, to our citizens and customers. Uh, and the second item I wanted to share with you was um, uh, a note we received uh, in the uh, commissioner's email account uh, that uh, was talking about traffic control going on over at uh, Carver, uh, near the Carver Bridge uh, area there, uh, and uh, Chris G. of Oregon City wrote, a big thank you to the county for providing flagger control at the Carver intersection uh, during the recent busy rafting weekends. It helped so much. Uh, thank you uh, from the residents stuck uh, on the south side. I do hope that the new signal that is planned for the intersection um, uh, will simulate uh, the work of the flaggers. Again, heartfelt thanks for the flagger help and for finally getting the bridge uh, on the way to being fully used. I uh, want to thank uh, Chris for the note. We appreciate it. Just a special word to Mr. Mike Besner uh, and Randy Harmon for helping to make that happen out there when we heard that there were some terrific congestion problems at that interchange or intersection. Great. Thank you, and first up is Sonia Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
I appreciate being able to uh, appear by phone today to facilitate um, travel schedule. I wanted to let the commission know a little story that occurred this weekend. I um, appeared at the pods to help assist in painting them with a couple dozen donuts for the crew. And because I had to take my kitten or my cat into surgery in the morning, I didn't get there until about 9 a.m. And we had all finished painting the floors of the pods. So I was left with the difficult task of having two dozen donuts of which there was no one to eat. So my husband and I decided to go by the clock in the service center to see if we could leave them there. It is not quite open yet. It is, um, has some still a little bit more work to do before it's actually open to the public. But I was able to um, deliver the donuts to a group of individuals who were there on 82nd Avenue. And I just had wonderful sense of community and camaraderie with these folks. They all were homeless. We shared stories with each other. I heard what their life is like and what their challenges are. There was one gentleman named Gary who I talked a little more in depth with who um, told me his challenges because he doesn't have a valid ID and what problems that presents for him. I was able to take his picture, get his information, get it over to Deborah Mason, who runs the Talking to Service Center, and she's in the process of facilitating getting that ID for Gary. And I also got to hear firsthand um, sort of the feelings about our veterans' cause. Um, there was one gentleman that was was off away from the group, but I had heard what the other folks about that's on the waiting list to get into the veterans shelter, and there's real positive feelings out there from that group. I um, was pretty enlightened by these folks, and I just am thankful that our commission is committed to working on this issue. No one should have to sleep outside. It is really terrible, but it is heartwarming that we have again today passed the housing emergency, which gives the flexibility that our staff needs to most effectively, effectively deal with this problem. It's very good that we have our homelessness and housing task force studying this issue so we can get the support from our members in the community to push an agenda that can move the dial. And it is also very good that our whole commission is aligned and committed to tackling this issue along with our partners in the region. So that's all I have for today. Well, thank you. Thank you. Have a good conference. Uh, next up is uh, Martha. Okay. So, well, uh, my colleagues were out helping to play paint pods uh, this Past weekend, I was actually attending a conference in Portland, uh, and it was dealing with uh, training uh, our growing Asian American population on civic culture and how to get involved in public service here. And many of you folks know I, it's near and dear to my heart as an exchange student to the Philippines way back in 1970, and many people know that my youngest son is Korean, and I've worked closely with the Holt Adoption Agency for years ago, that it's a, it's a real, real good issue, I think, to get involved in. And so we had speakers, Lori Stegman, uh, we had professional speakers, they had uh, uh, a homelessness uh, conversation, they had a panel on how to get involved in public service. I had the privilege to be the lunch speaker and talk a little bit about what Clackamas County does and to actually just field lots of questions. And one of the things I learned is I was fielding questions, uh, and I didn't realize this, but I'm glad I know this now, is that actually we have probably uh, one of the fastest growing Asian Amer American populations in the region. Uh, and 20% of our population now in Clackamas County is Asian American, and there is a lot of growth and movement in Happy Valley to our high growth area where people are going. So I hopefully will be working with Emmett Wheatfall, our diversity and equity person, uh, to really get a handle on demographics, not only of our Asian American population, but our Latino uh, po population, our Russian population, get a, get a whole scope and sense of uh, who our diverse uh, groups are here in the county. It was a very rewarding experience, and um, 
I'd really like to, I'm uh, looking at Don here, I'd really like to see, I know we have a class called County 101, do we not? Do we have a Citizens, Citizens County Academy? Academy. Citizens Academy, I would really like to make sure that we get the information out to this demographic and group. I think they would be very, very interested <coughs> in uh, participating. They were very interested in internships. And I said to them, you don't have to be an elected person to do public service that with all the retirements that we are really dealing with, that um, actually the opportunities if folks want to get a master's in public administration or a doctorate or, you know, have particular agency interests, human services, water environment services, uh, business and community development, that we need to get folks, maybe young people <coughs> and as interns to see those as po possible career pathways. So I'd like to talk to you about that and find out when the next academy is opened up. I think it's in the middle, isn't it, Don, right now of the process? Okay, so I'd like to find out when the next academy is going to occur so we can plug this in for, okay. for these folks. And uh, really was absolutely a great, great um, opportunity. The other thing is that I, I have associations with the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Um, that includes places like Cambodia, the Philippines, um, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Tasmania, all those other countries. And I know that folks from that group are interested in visiting us. So I'm hopeful we can make, connect all the dots with the folks I worked with this weekend and maybe, maybe actually do something even bigger and better for our export initiative to make those contacts. So any case, that was really fun. And thank you, gentlemen, for um, taking care of the pod piece. Um, because we've had conversations about gun rights, I, I just wanted to say what I support. I was one of the commissioners way back when that really worked to make sure that our public training safety center stayed open. Because at the public training safety center, people have the opportunity to go in and test or use various different firearms at the shooting range. But the key thing that they do is provide appropriate uh, and extensive firearm education. All of my kids have been through those classes because all of my kids shoot, uh, you know, target shoot and things of that sort. And so I think really, to be responsible gun owners, I would strongly encourage people to go to the center, uh, get the training there, get your certifications, understand uh, the pros and cons of what owning fire or firearms can do. Because one of the other things that I just wanted to mention was uh, listening to the National Public Radio the other day. They were talking about Sandy Hook, and Sandy Hook obviously was the shooting where all the 20 children were murdered, over 20 children and adults. And there is evidently a group out there that is saying that it was a sham and Sandy Hook never happened. And uh, they had one of the parents who was the father of one of the six-year-old girls who was murdered, and he talked about the harassment that they were getting. He talked about how painful it was to have this kind of thing revisited again and again and again. And to have that out there is so hurtful and so harmful. So when we talk about guns and gun rights, we have to put it in context and, per and perspective of some of the things that are happening in our society today. When we have students who are actually being trained in high schools and schools on safe places to go, what to hide in case of an active shooter, those are things that we have to pay attention to. And that's why the education for appropriate gun ownership is, is so important to me. So uh, it's not a one-sided issue. It's a very complex issue with many facets. And um, we seem to be in a period where uh, we're, we're using firearms to harm other people. You know, And that's not what they're for. They're to hunt, to shoot, to recreate, to target shoot, you know, to, to enjoy responsibly. So uh, I would encourage everyone to take classes at the Public Training Safety Center. So that's my editorial for the day. So I'm going to go on to the word of the week. Okay. Okay. It's coming up in a minute, guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> word of the week is mentor, noun, a counselor, or teacher. Did you know in contemporary use, mentor usually refers to a senior figure in business or politics, for instance, who aids the progress of a junior figure's career? Our retiring finance director, Mark Gonzalez, 
has served as a mentor to many county employees during his three decade career. And I would also say, so does our, uh, our administrator, Don Krupp, could be actually substituted in there as well. So you've been a great mentor to all of us. Arts and culture in the county. Third annual Oregon Trail Brew, Brew Fest uh, is going to be presented by the Oregon City Brewing Company as the first brew fest to celebrate breweries along the Oregon Trail. Taste beers from Kansas City to Boise to Oregon City, the official end of the Oregon Trail, featuring beer from Missouri, Nebraska, Wyoming, Idaho, Oregon, and Oregon City, of course. Saturday and Sunday, August 4th, 11 to 9 p.m. and 5, uh, noon to 4 p.m. at the end of the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center. Westland Historical Society presents Michael McCloskey, A Glimpse into History. Guest author Michael McCloskey reads and discusses his new book, A Glimpse into History, What Prominent People Have Said About Nature in Oregon and the Need to Conserve It. Sunday, August 5th, 2 p.m. at the Westland Library Community Room. Also, Annie, the musical is playing at Clackamas County Repertory Theater uh, at Clackamas Community College. I encourage people to buy tickets and see the play. And Lakewood Theater of the Arts is presenting the musical Chess. For more information, please visit the Arts Alliance website, clackamasartsalliance.org. It's your turn, Chair. <laughs> or maybe it's Mr. Humber. Right, then, it's Ken, Ken's up next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey. Oh, sorry. Before Ken talks, can I just put a plug in for Chess at Lakewood? I saw it last weekend, and it was wonderful. It is a very relevant play for today's political climate in that it deals with chess, Russia, espionage, all kinds of interesting um, twists and turns, and it was very, very well performed. So I just had to give that little plug for our wonderful Lakewood Center for the Arts. Thank you. Ken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, before I get into the things we did this week, um, I thought, and especially given what uh, Commissioner Schrader had to say that I would uh, reflect a little bit on Constitution and rights and that sort of thing. Um, having sworn an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States at least 13 times in my lifetime, I take it seriously. As someone who wrote the check when I went in the Marine Corps, I certainly took it at that time as well as my career in law enforcement. But there is an attitude sometimes that somehow this is a document that is a dead document. I would like to uh, put an end to that because it is not a dead document. For starters, it has a process for amendment, which in and of itself implies that the document is a living document and can, in fact, be changed under certain circumstances. The second thing I'd like to point out is that when Chief Justice Roberts was um, interviewed for the position of Chief Justice, and he was asked about how you interpret the Constitution. And I'm going to paraphrase this poorly, but he basically said in the Constitution there are things that are absolutes, i.e., it takes two-thirds of the Senate to approve a treaty, as an example. Those are absolutes. It's not nine-sixteenths or three-eighths. It's two-thirds. Then there are those that are precedent, i.e., the original case, Marbury versus Madison, which ultimately gave the Supreme Court the authority to actually review uh, what, is a, what is a constitutional or not constitutional act of Congress or law. Uh, that was established via precedent, because the Constitution does not specifically grant the Supreme Court that power word for word. And then there are implied rights, such as the right of privacy. Uh, the uh, Constitution says that the, uh, your papers are private unless there's a warrant, that you can't have your home invaded by the police unless there is a warrant, that troops cannot be quartered in your home unless there's a warrant. That is an implied right of privacy of which a number of laws have been passed. The next thing that I would point out to people is that Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18 of the Constitution is known as the Necessary and Proper Clause of the Constitution, and I would like to read that to people. To make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or the department or officer thereof. What that says is the Congress essentially has the power to pass the laws they need to pass to get the job done and deal with the, the, uh, um, the, the running of a country. 
And finally, philosophically, uh, if you have not been to Washington, D.C., I encourage people to go there, and I particularly encourage people to go to the Jefferson Memorial. And I'm going to read one of the um, quotes that are carved in marble on the Jefferson Memorial, because I think this illustrates what was the intent of our founders at that time most eloquently. Quote, I am not an advocate for frequent changes in laws and constitutions, but laws and institutions must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind. As that becomes more developed, more enlightened, as new discoveries are made, new truths discovered, and manners and opinions change, with the change of circumstances, institutions must advance also to keep pace with the times. We might as well require a man to wear still the coat which fitted him when a boy as civilized society to remain ever under the regimen of their barbarous ancestors. So from the documents that we have in front of us to the philosophy of the founders, I think it makes it clear that the Constitution is a living document and has to adjust to the times. That said, this week was a very interesting week. Um, as was already alluded to, we, um, we went to the uh, Vets Village and began the painting process there, saw some of the facilities that are being put in place, and are looking forward to seeing this facility opened up before the cold weather hits. Um, I had the opportunity to go to another cruise in with my car in Sandy, where I had the opportunity to talk to a lot of folks as county commissioner, where they asked me a lot of questions about everything from land use planning to what's going on with the, the, the meandering Sandy River and the floodplain evaluation of that area. Uh, even got questions regarding Second Amendment rights and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, it was a great opportunity, to, again, to, to uh, just talk with folks that um, don't always get to come to our meetings. Uh, and then last, um, I received a, uh, an email from a constituent in Colton regarding a law enforcement problem or a criminal problem, I guess would be a better, better approach, that they had in Colton. So I contacted Sheriff Roberts and I asked him to see if his folks could take a look at that. And then I attended the Colton Town Hall a couple of nights ago. Three of the Sheriff Department's officers were present. Um, about 40 to 50 citizens were present, which is a, quite a turnout for a, a community as small as Colton, quite frankly. And uh, some good discussions were held regarding how to deal with some of the uh, theft and other problems that are going on in the community. The Sheriff's going to be working with the neighborhood livability concept to work with the community. And I got an email today, this is two days after the meeting, where some of the citizens were able to feel comfortable in calling the Sheriff's Department about suspicious people that they saw. The Sheriff's Department was able to respond and I think that at least two arrests were made as a result of that. Um, and finally, I don't remember the gentleman's name, but um, I do remember that he's a former Marine uh, who lives in Colton, and they have raised the money and are purchasing four brand spanking new refrigerators for the Vets Village. And I want to say thank you to the community of Colton for that, their, their uh, spirit of volunteerism and also their willingness to work with the sheriff to help solve some problems in their community. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dog. Oh, the dog. Got me again. <laughs> Got me again. Here we go. This is Casanova, and although he has an Arctic birthright, he is very much like a certain Italian romantic adventurer. Just as his name implies, he loves the ladies and they love him. He has a playful nature, high energy level, and ice blue eyes. He would benefit from further education in lease skills and basic obedience. A secure yard and attentive owners, along with lots of exercise, will keep him safe from wandering. He would do best with kids nine plus and no cats. Go and meet him today and begin a new adventure. For more information about Casanova and other adoptable dogs, please contact Clackamas County Dog Services at 503-655-8628 or www.clackamas.us forward slash dogs. Thank you. Great. And Ken, may I say you never cease to amaze me <laughs> <laughs> on that uh, Constitution stuff. I mean, you're... You never cease to amaze me. 
Um, I actually learned something yesterday that I had never known yeah. out at the pods. And that is, you know, I've actually said this. I said, you know, this is a lot of money. We probably could have bought an apartment <laughs> complex and put the vets in there. But you know that if you do that, vets lose their benefits <laughs> because you've housed them. So the pods are exactly what they are. They're transition. You know, they don't have bathrooms. Uh, they're... They're pods, they're sleeping pods. And we provide, even if you bought a building and housed them all, that's called housing. Pods are pods, it's transitional. But if you do, if you bought a motel or something and, and housed the vets, they would be considered housed and they lose their voucher benefits. Mm -hmm. I never knew that until yesterday. Evidently, while they were in DC, they did talk about that issue. and. Uh, Yesterday, Congressman Schrader was there. He hadn't heard about that either. So I thank Paul Savas for, for letting us know that. It was, it was very helpful. Tell the congressman that you're proud. Yeah. <laughs> Martha. Um, you know, I, we talk about uh, everybody I've worked with since I've been elected has been a mentor. And Don, you, you have too. Uh, but Mike Swanson was the first person I ever worked with um, yeah, yeah, when I was elected mayor. I talked him into staying there as long as I was there. He left shortly after, but he taught me about budgets. And he also, when I did get elected, he told me that Mark Gonzalez was a guy that uh, I could trust at the county when Mark's retired. Uh, I think we have some great people in his place. And um, uh, I think Mark, Mark has just done a great job. We're going to have a lot of retirements and an organization that's changing rapidly. And us as commissioners uh, need to focus on, on that, uh, that we bring the commission into the, the, the next century. Uh, and I mentioned earlier Wes. You know, finding employees has become very difficult. When I was in the automotive repair business, I mean, we've suffered from lack of mechanics for, I don't know, I was president of Portland Automotive Association, and this was 20 years ago, and we couldn't find people to replace the mechanics we had. It's, uh, and we have a great opportunities at the county, so be sure and watch the website for job opportunities. Um, also, Annie, I'll never forget that my, I took my little niece and she said, there's a, there's a person in that dog costume. It was, uh, it was a dog. <laughs> I thought that was the cutest thing I ever heard. It's also, uh, you, you know, the dog that you were talking about. I was, in the yard yesterday, and my dogs, two of them, uh, spend their time in the backyard with my chickens, which I thought would be a very big challenge to not let them. I think one time they did something, I stopped them, and never since have they bothered the chicken, unless the chicken tries to take the bone away from them. But anyway, uh, I think the pod project, it's got a long way to go, but it's, it's, uh, one of the most important things about uh, anyone homeless is, uh, uh, is a place to stay, a place to store their stuff. And so housing first, and I think that's the first step. Having an address, it's amazing how important it is to have an address. Yeah, so the, they will all have their own address, and um, um, it's just a, 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 it's a great investment, even though it's more than we anticipated. We're also, uh, the first actually permitted uh, um, veterans housing development. Um, so, you know, we did all the things we're supposed to do to uh, accommodate the code in the county. And I think that's, that's also amazing. Uh, that took a lot, and that's the other reason it costs so much. But it's a, it's a great opportunity. But still, we got a long way to go. Over 50% of homeless people are families with children. 
Uh, you know, this is our first step, but where we go from here is going to be very difficult. And there's a bond measure that citizens are going to have an opportunity to vote on that uh, people really need to look at and consider because uh, we got a long way to go. I remember when I first got here um, that the Baldock Park uh, um, rest stop just outside of West uh, Wilsonville, they had to send a school bus to pick up kids in the morning. There were people living there. And so a school bus used to pick up the kids. And that's incredible. And then hunger is so rampant in this country. It's amazing that we still have kids going home hungry. I think the school district has gone a long way to make that much better in the summers, providing food. And on weekends, uh, uh, pack, Backpack Buddy. Um, there's a lot of uh, work which we participate in. People apply for grants. And um, anyway, we did talk at the conference about uh, maybe like a summer school program to attract kids to uh, working at the county, Wes, for example, learn what we do and uh, think about it. And um, there's great career opportunities. It's not that you have great PERS benefits because that's changed. Uh, so, but it's a great place to work, and we have a lot of great people dedicated to providing outstanding service. And I can tell you, once a month, we do a recognition lunch for people who have 5, 10, 20, 30 years, and I think once we had a 40 year, I'm not sure. We have one right now who is 40 years. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they couldn't get a job anywhere else. <laughs> But anyway, uh, I, I just think they built the department. Right? <laughs> they probably did. Um, anyway, so uh, appreciate uh, you coming today. And with that, oh, Mary has to remind me every time. So we have a business meeting at the Clackamas County Fair Thursday, August 16th, 2018 at 10 a.m. That's the Clackamas County Fair main stage. Arrive before 10 for free ad admission. So please join us at the Clackamas County Fair and Rodeo on August 16th for our business meeting. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.